Hello everyone, I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in REN21. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Christine Linz and Morgan Bazilian joining us. This great group of panelists will be discussing the REN21 Renewables 2013 Global Status Report with a focus on North America. Uh, one important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the, the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices, resources, reviewed, and selected by technical experts. Now you have uh, several features for the webinar today. Uh, for audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing this will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. And if you select the telephone option, a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin that you should use to dial in. And panelists, we just ask that you please mute your audio device while you are not presenting. And if anyone has any technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826. And if you'd like to ask any questions during the webinar, which we always encourage, uh, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type in your question. I will then present those questions to the panelists during the question and answer session at the end. If you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you can find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you may follow along as our speakers present. Also, an audio recording of the presentation will be po uh, posted to the Solutions Center training page within a few weeks of this webinar. Now we have a great agenda prepared for you today that is focused on the RUN21 Renewables 2013 Global Status Report and also provides an overview of the status of renewable energy in North America. Now before our speakers begin their presentations, I just want to provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. And then following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session and wrap up with closing remarks and a very brief survey. Now this slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center came to be. The Solution Center is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial and is supported through a partnership with UN Energy. It was launched in April of 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. Outcomes of this unique group of, uh, partnership include support of developing countries through enhancement of resources and policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools, such as this webinar. The Solution Center has four primary goals. It serves as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. It also serves to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. Third, the Solution Center delivers dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And lastly, the center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. Now, our primary audience is energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. But we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. A marquee feature that the Solution Center is uh, proud to offer is the expert policy assistance. It's known as Ask an Expert, and it's a great service offered at zero cost. So we've established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries. For example, in the area of renewable energy finance and sustainable energy planning, we are very pleased to have Wilson Rickerson of Meister Consultants Group serving as our expert. And if you have a need for policy assistance on renewables or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this useful service. Again, this assistance is provided free of charge and to request assistance, you simply submit your request by registering through our Ask an Expert feature at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. And we encourage you to explore and take advantage of the Solution Center resources and services, including the expert policy assistance. Be, uh, subscribe to our newsletter and then participate in webinars like these. 
And now I'd like to provide brief introductions of our distinguished panelists. First up is Christine Lin, Executive Secretary of RUN21, who will discuss the key findings of the 2013 Global Status Report. And then following Christine, we will hear from Morgan Bazilian, Deputy Director of the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis at NREL. Morgan will be discussing findings from the REN21 Renewable Global Status Report relevant to North America, and will also provide an overview of renewable energy in North America. And with those introductions, uh, please join me in welcoming Christine Lin to the webinar. Thank you very much, Sean. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For me, good afternoon. I'm speaking to you here from uh, Paris, France. I understand that by now you can see my screen and uh, we are set to go. And it's a pleasure for me uh, to be here at this uh, webinar hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center and give you an overview on global renewable energy status with a focus on North America. It's also particularly uh, a pleasure to be here today with Morgan Basilian, a long-time colleague. And uh, we hope to be able to uh, share interesting insights uh, with you in the next uh, hour. So, uh, in a nutshell, uh, I'm going to present you the key findings, but before doing this, uh, of the Global Status Report. Uh, but before doing this, uh, let me give you a quick overview on uh, REN21. REN21 is a, a multi-stakeholder policy network, a renewable energy network for the 21st century that was created at the Renewables 2004 in uh, Bonn, Germany uh, in 2004. So we are in operation uh, for about a decade. Uh, it's what I would call the coalition of the willing of stakeholders both from the private and the public sector, uh, national governments, international organizations, NGOs, industry associations, uh, science and academia, to, uh, that all work on advancing renewables. We have ACOR, the American Council on Renewable Energy, as a member. We are closely working uh, with the uh, U.S. government, who has been on the REN21 steering committee uh, up until the end of last year. We are currently, as we have slightly changed structures, uh, working out a, a procedure to have them uh, back on board. And we work also closely with NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the U.S., uh, towards uh, the uptake of renewables on a global level. Uh, together with also the IEA, as well as uh, IRENA and uh, several of the UN uh, agencies, as well as the World Bank. We are producing an annual report on the status of renewable energy that is always launched in June, along with uh, UNEP's Global Trends in Renewable Energy Investment. And that is based on a team of over 500 contributors, researchers and reviewers worldwide, uh, giving an overview on the global market, overview, uh, industry trends, uh, policy landscape, uh, as well as has a special focus on um, decentralized uh, renewables in developing countries. It covers all renewable energy technologies, both uh, the power sector, heating and cooling, as well as transport. And uh, we always introduce uh, a new element in each year's report, and in 2013 that was a feature on system transformation, as we see that uh, at the moment when uh, shares of renewables increase, the importance of uh, integrating them into energy systems is becoming more and more important. In, uh, for North America, we work uh, together with, uh, amongst others, uh, the World Watch Institute, and um, the report is downloadable free of charge from the REN21 website, uh, www.ren21.net where you also find uh, a lot of um, uh, country documentation on the Renewables Interactive Map. So in a nutshell, where do renewable energy stand uh, in the world? Uh, at uh, the end of 2011, renewables supplied an estimated 19% of global final energy consumption. Also, all the figures in the Global Status Report uh, 2013 are for 2012. When it comes to uh, shares uh, of renewables in global final energy consumption, uh, this is the only figure that is uh, going up to 2011, as uh, we have to uh, also get the share of global final energy consumption there in order to put the renewables development into perspective. So, um, you see uh, that this share is comprised of roughly half uh, modern renewables and another half uh, of traditional biomass. 
and uh, it is clear uh, the objective uh, to significantly increase the share, the share of modern renewables in the years to come and to find ways of uh, limiting the traditional use of biomass uh, globally, mainly in the developing countries. We also give an overview on uh, the top uh, renewable energy champions and markets you have there in the uh, bold or red surrounded uh, columns you have uh, both uh, new capacity investment as well as total capacity as of, as of the end of 2012. And there you clearly see um, that the United States are uh, very uh, prominently um, um, represented in this uh, list of, uh, of top countries. And uh, not only the United States, but also uh, Canada uh, when it comes to ethanol production or also in the field of hydropower or uh, also renewable power capacity uh, excluding um, hydropower. Um, and it just here that I hope you can hear me all well because I just got the message that the connection might be bad, but I think uh, we are back on track. So um, what does that mean? in terms of uh, power, the global uh, market overview for the power markets, we see that renewable energy comprised uh, about 26% of global power generation capacity in 2012 and uh, the United States, uh, in the United States renewables accounted for 12.2% uh, of net electricity generation and globally uh, roughly 22% uh, of electricity uh, are generated uh, from uh, renewables. Uh, we see that in, uh, for the first time in 2012, more than half of uh, the new uh, electric capacity installed was renewables based in some parts of the world, uh, such as in Europe, this share was even higher. In Europe, 71% uh, of, uh, of all power plants that came online uh, to the system in 2012 were renewables based. So these figures clearly show that renewables are making their way into uh, mainstream uh, energy systems. We had, uh, we are not covering only um, electricity in the GSR, but we are also focusing on the heating and cooling as well as the transport market. And there we see that in heating and cooling there is a general trend towards the use of larger systems. And uh, we see quite uh, an impressive spread of solar collectors uh, over more than 56 countries for water and increasingly for space heating. As far as transport is concerned, liquid biofuels provide about 3.4% uh, of global road transport fuels in 2012. And uh, we see that many uh, countries, more and more countries are putting in place um, policies promoting uh, electric uh, vehicles and we often see that these policies are closely tied with uh, renewable energy promotion, promotion, especially at the local level. So uh, I'm not uh, going to go through all this in detail, but generally in the Global Status Report you have a very detailed overview on uh, the trends uh, and emerging uh, markets for the different technologies. Just a word on hydropower, in 2012 30 gigawatts of new hydropower were added. Uh, and uh, we see uh, that the, both uh, the United States and Canada uh, are playing uh, a top role uh, in this market and we see that there are more and more uh, joint ventures uh, put in place both at uh, the local and international level uh, as uh, the size of projects increase and we also saw in 2000, uh, so we saw recently a revisiting of the decision of the World Bank to uh, finally again uh, funding uh, hydropower projects. So uh, with this we will also probably see um, more development in the years to come. As far as solar photovoltaics is concerned, development has been impressive. Uh, to total op uh, global operating capacity of solar PV reached uh, the 100 gigawatt milestone uh, last year. Uh, that was something that uh, nobody would have estimated that the development goes so quickly. If you just look a bit at the graph, you see that basically it took us 15 years from 1995 to 2010 to go to 40 gigawatt, a quite slow but steady increase. But then when looking between 2010 and 2012, you see that this capacity more than doubled within two years 
uh, with, uh, on the one hand, which brought uh, prices of solar PV modules significantly down. They fell uh, by more than 30% in 2012, but also this clearly shows that the technology is becoming more affordable also for developing countries and in many parts of the world it is now at grid parity and, uh, and so solar becomes really a competitive uh, source with uh, conventional fuels. Uh, the United States uh, is uh, in the lead uh, in the field of PV with the world's largest uh, uh, PV facility, the 250 megawatt uh, thin film plant in, in Arizona. Moving on to wind power, you also see uh, a continuous development in 2012, uh, almost 45 gigawatt of wind power uh, capacity that came in operation. Uh, that in was an increase uh, in global capacity by 19%. Uh, and North America alone, out of this 45, added 14 uh, gigawatts. Uh, and you just see uh, the graph just shows a very uh, continuous uh, annual growth rate which is quite impressive and which uh, speaks, I think, for itself. Uh, the same, or not the same, but a, a similar development in the concentrating solar thermal power. Uh, also, there was a very steady market and steady situation uh, for, the, for, for the last uh, decades. Uh, we basically uh, see uh, a rush in, uh, or a significant increase in the market. Uh, with total CSP capacity increasing more than 60 percent um, in uh, 2012 to about 2.5 uh, gigawatt and uh, there the U.S. remained the second largest market ending the year with 507 megawatts in operation. The, the U.S. and Spain traditionally being the, uh, the historic markets for PV, we see right now that there is also a lot of development in uh, the Middle East and North Africa, as well as uh, interest, growing interest in uh, Asia and uh, in Latin America for uh, CSP technologies. Bioenergy, also uh, a very important uh, component of, uh, of the renewables mix. We have already seen bioenergy being used for the production of power. For the uh, in the um, in the heating and cooling sector as well as uh, for uh, for transport and here you see uh, a big uh, pole position of the United States uh, in biopower generation and also Canada in in quite a, a prominent spot. Uh, I mentioned before liquid biofuels providing 3.4 percent of global road transport fuels. Uh, there we see that in 2012 uh, the global production of fuel ethanol was down and uh, that is the, basically the, the, the yellow uh, graph uh, whereas the uh, production from biodiesel increased, in, in, increased uh, slightly. Uh, the United States accounted for 61% of the global ethanol production and is the world's leading uh, biodiesel producer, so a very, very strong um, uh, dominance of the U.S. in these markets. Geothermal energy, uh, there the United States added 147 megawatt of geothermal generating capacity, um, increasing the total capacity by 5% to 3.4 gigawatts, and there also we have uh, both big plants, uh, but also small-scale uh, heat pumps uh, using uh, geothermal energy. I mentioned before the uh, increasing uh, trend of solar uh, thermal, uh, with 56 countries around the world having uh, solar thermal uh, in use for heating and uh, more and more for space heating. Uh, global solar thermal capacity uh, in 2012 reached an estimated uh, 255 gigawatt thermal for placed uh, water collectors and there is more and more use of this technology in uh, industrial, for industrial processes. Industry trends, in a nutshell, uh, we saw continued growth on the one hand, however we saw uh, uncertain policy environments and declining policy support that uh, especially in the OECD countries that affected investment climates in a number of uh, markets uh, and that slowed the momentum in both uh, Europe, uh, China uh, as well as India and uh, of course also the uh, continued price reductions uh, to a certain extent uh, 
presently uh, quite some uh, challenges for the industry. So we saw some industry consolidation, but we also see uh, as a clear trend that renewables are being more affordable nowadays in both the developed and the developing countries. And uh, we also see that uh, more and more countries are uh, putting in place uh, local content requirements where actually the manufacturing uh, shifts uh, towards uh, these markets and we see a clear uh, shift in uh, investment towards uh, developing countries. I'll come to this in a second. As far as uh, jobs are concerned, worldwide renewable energy employment continues to increase. We have an estimated 5.7 million people uh, nowadays working in the renewable sector with the bulk of employment uh, still remaining concentrated in uh, Brazil, China, India, the EU and the United States. As far as investment is concerned, uh, there you see that uh, global investment in renewable power went down 12% uh, from the previous uh, year's record. This is still the second highest uh, ever investment. Um, at the same time, installed capacity continue to grow due to falling uh, technology costs. Uh, investment in the United States uh, went down 35%. So uh, that is uh, effectively uh, challenging for the industry. There was a big boom uh, before uh, recovery money that had to be spent. Uh, the uh, production uh, tax credit that uh, uh, was discontinued and then put in place again, definitely having an impact, uh, showed an impact on, on the investment patterns. And I think what is most interesting is the shift uh, in the balance of investment activity between developed and developing economies. So these 244 uh, billion US dollars are composed of 112 billion that were invested in developing countries. Uh, so now there's 46% of global investment in the renewable sector is going to uh, developing countries. That was in increased from uh, compared to 2011 by 34%. And the developed economies on the other side, uh, their investment fell uh, by 29% to 132 billion. That was the lowest level since 2009. I think that clearly uh, shows on the one hand the impact of the financial crisis, but is on the other hand also very encouraging because we see that uh, the markets where um, energy demand is growing uh, steadily are the ones that are also increasing investment in renewables, which I think uh, is a very encouraging trend. As far as policy is concerned, still uh, the most in important enabling factor for renewables, uh, the number of countries with renewable energy targets has more than doubled between 2005 and 2012. We have nowadays uh, around 140 countries with renewable energy targets uh, in place and about 130 countries with clear-cut uh, policies. Most policies to support renewables are found in the power sector with uh, feeding tariffs and renewable portfolio standards uh, being the most frequently used, but we also see uh, that uh, there is an emergence of uh, use of uh, tenders. Uh, I just come back from South Africa where the government has just completed, very successfully completed the second uh, bidding round and is about to announce the third one where uh, prices have gone down uh, quite significantly and uh, project developers and industry seem to be very happy uh, with uh, that system. We see all around the world that policymakers are increasingly aware of the potential national development impacts of renewable energy and there are lots of different uh, policies in place throughout the world which are all uh, comprehensively uh, portrayed in the policy table of the Global Status Report uh, where you can view the instruments used on a country by country basis. Uh, a quick outlook. You might have heard of uh, the UN Secretary General's uh, initiative Sustainable Energy for All which uh, sets three complementary goals to be reached uh, on a global scale by 2030, which consists of ensuring universal access to modern energy services by 2030, uh, by, which consists of doubling the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency and, last but not least, doubling the share of uh, renewable energy in the global energy mix. All these three goals are uh, complementary. 
And uh, earlier this year, um, under the coordination of the World Bank and the International Energy Agency, we completed a global tracking framework, which basically uh, sets uh, a baseline, which is set in 2010, where uh, renewable share in total final energy consumption was 18%, which shed, sets uh, the objective of doubling uh, the share of renewables in the global mix uh, from 18 to roughly 36%. So you might remember the graph I showed at the beginning. In 2011, we were at 19%. So developing development slow, and of course also, uh, but continuous uh, in the right direction. Of course, the share always also depends on how uh, global energy demand uh, is uh, effectively uh, advancing. Uh, but still, we have uh, a lot of different scenarios uh, where we see that uh, reaching this uh, share of 36% um, renewable energy uh, in uh, 2030 is uh, feasible. It is not uh, feasible when following conservative um, energy scenarios uh, like outlined, uh, like the ones outlined here in, uh, in, in brown and, and yellow. Uh, but when it comes to the uh, high renewables and high energy efficiency scenarios, we see that uh, the 36% the in 2030 definitely uh, are in the range uh, of what's feasible. And effectively, uh, just uh, finally showing you that uh, I think we must not forget that uh, the future of our energy sector depends on the decisions that we take today. And we see that historic projections have fallen short. So here I just brought um, on the left uh, some analysis of scenarios that we did in the framework of the Renewables Global Futures Report that we launched earlier this year, which just show that uh, the IEA in, in their projections uh, where, where wind would be, global wind would be in 2010, these were projections done in, in the year 2000, they got it uh, wrong. So you see the projected uh, amount uh, in gigawatts uh, on the, uh, as, the, as the blue bar and the actual amount effectively uh, the red bar where we actually ended up. World Bank 1997, their, uh, their forecast for wind power in China uh, for um, 2020, and then the red bar showing where actually we were in China with wind in 2011, so a decade earlier than these projections, uh, which I, just, I think just underlines that uh, many of the developments that we've seen lately in the renewable sector uh, could not have been anticipated uh, a couple of years ago because we really saw massive changes, massive uh, increase uh, in the renewables and, uh, and speeding up of both technology development prices coming down and, and also deployment. However, uh, it is clear uh, that this doubling of the share uh, of renewables uh, that is outlined under sustainable energy for all will need to result in at least a tripling of the share of modern renewables, including sustainable hydropower, as we do not want to increase the share of traditional biomass, what I mentioned before. And for this, I think uh, it is important to remember that uh, we will need both the centralized as well as the decentralized renewables and um, we also we need in the future to put the focus on integration of renewable energy uh, in both uh, in the energy system both in a technical way but also uh, in a policy way this is I think something that uh, both Enron and Run21 are interested to uh, pursuing uh, for the research and with this I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I would like to head back uh, to the uh, Clean Energy Solutions Center for the next presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Christine. Um, and Sean, I see you've uh, got my slide back up. It's very difficult to, to follow Christine. She gives such a, uh, a lovely overview, and the work of the REN21 keeps getting better and better and more and more useful for all of us. I've been engaged with that work since it started in, uh, about 10 years ago, as Christine said, and so it's an honor to speak uh, on this webinar both with her and uh, 
be supported by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which I think uh, likewise is doing tremendous work. Um, I'm going to give a fairly brief presentation, given that Christine has covered uh, a large amount of uh, material. These slides are going to remain uh, uh, available for you and will remain um, available offline for uh, questions as well as uh, if we don't get to them today. Um, I'm going to cover aspects of the REN21 report on North America. In that, I'm going to include um, some small discussion around uh, Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Um, I'm also going to turn to an issue that's not normally covered on uh, global status reports for renewables, which is uh, interactions with natural gas, um, since it's become such a large issue in, uh, across North America. So Heather or Sean, if I could have the next slide. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to look briefly at the, the league tables and the table rankings. Christine showed those briefly. A uh, little bit of uh, a somewhat eclectic look at some of the technologies um, that appear in the global status report. And then turn to uh, money, costs of uh, production and funding. And then, as I said, a little bit of uh, interaction with natural gas. So if I could have the next slide. Great. So we've highlighted uh, in these slides uh, the United States and Canada. Uh, Mexico does not show up on this annual investment uh, league table. You can see um, uh, where the United States, this is annual investment additions. So this is just from 2012, from last year's. Um, and the United States has been uh, number one on that league table in wind power, biodiesel, and ethanol. And Canada, of course, um, also uh, deeply engaged in hydropower and ethanol. Um, we'll touch a little bit more on the solar PV capacity. As Christine said, there's a new plant put up in Arizona, 250 megawatt thin fill plant put up in 2012. Um, and I think one of the uh, points we'll come back to is this capacity investment. I also wanted to raise, although it doesn't show up in the league table, that Mexico's investment in renewable energy increased more than fivefold, according to the, the status report, from uh, 352 million in 2011 to 2 billion in 2012. So that is a uh, significant increase, obviously, and something that uh, I thought was worth uh, highlighting when we discussed the league table. Next slide, please. So um, some wider of the, the league tables, and this is the status as of the end of 2012. So this is not an annual, but a, a cumulative figure. And you see Mexico show up as the fourth largest uh, country under geothermal power um, significantly. And of course, um, uh, Canada showing up uh, always very high on the hydropower of the United States and Canada. Canada getting an enormous percentage of their electricity from hydropower. Um, I think a couple of the more interesting ones include the, the, the total uh, the, the concentrating solar power. Um, the United States is second on that. And, um, and also Canada uh, in renewable power uh, it, it, in total, number four there. So those are some significant parts of these tables. You know, the, the tables themselves, uh, I think, are a really useful product of the GSR. Um, while I don't need to direct um, policy design or energy planning, what they do do is show off the countries that are making uh, either big increases in a year or, or, or showing off as the leaders in clean energy. And obviously, you see China and Germany at the top of a lot of those, which we uh, won't be covering today. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of a, a summary slide here. Um, if, if I can draw your attention down to this bottom part of the slide, the, the share of electricity generation from renewables. And as I said, Canada is very significant at 63%. It's primarily hydro. Uh, and you will find that number slightly higher and slightly lower in different forms. But the GSR's uh, methodology shows that it roughly 63%.
still very significant at 17 in Canada and about 7% uh, in Mexico. Um, so just to give you a sense of scale uh, across North American countries and uh, um, what they look like um, in comparison to uh, you know other countries you might have seen, um, say uh, Norway shows up at the GSR at 65% on final energy, so hugely uh, significant there. Next slide, please. A couple key stories that struck me as I was going through the uh, the GSR and, and sort of searching for Canada, U, U.S., and Mexico, um, and uh, one of the North America's the top ethanol consuming and producing region. That that remains the case. Those numbers are a little bit flat. They saw a slight upward swing this year, but but generally flat. And I think, as many of you know, are heavily dependent on uh, regulation and standards uh, for the market side. Um, North America saw. PV, uh, 3.6 gigawatts of new PV installed in 2012, and I think Christine mentioned the PV sector uh, thrilled to meet their 100 gigawatt uh, overall total capacity. That, that, that's an enormous uh, accomplishment, so we're pleased to see that. Uh, in the U.S., one big story was about the late 2012 wind installation. The timing of that uh, uh, has a lot to do with the um, production tax credit in the United States, um, which you would have seen goes, uh, uh, drives this kind of a temporal um, installation process that, that may, may not be ideal. About 13 gigawatts uh, installed in the U.S., uh, mostly in Q4. Uh, also, I think this is maybe the, the biggest story overall of the GSR, but that in the U.S., the renewable energy um, power comprise about 50% of total power installed. And that, that story, um, I think, is going to be the big one coming out of this uh, global status report from 20, you know, the last couple of years that renewables is now installing, you know, about half or even more than half in some places of power. Now that, that's a huge change. Uh, Mexico saw a big a hydro plant off 750 megawatts. It has this huge um, vertical face, 220 meters. Um, they also saw that investment go up 5x, as I, as I highlighted in one of the first slides. In Canada, that ranks number five in renewables per capita, non-hydro. And that might be one of the better indicators that the GSR gives. That per capita figure is really, uh, in my mind, one of the more um, useful metrics we can look at across countries to compare them. And Calgary, uh, interestingly, became 100% uses 100% renewable energy and electricity for their municipal functions. That's, a, that's a, quite an achievement. So those are just some of the ones that struck me out of the uh, roughly three to 400 mentions in the GSR of US, Mexico, and Canada. Um, I just picked out about uh, six of them. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not seeing that next slide. Uh, Sean or Heather, are, are others seeing the next slide? Yeah, it's up there, Morgan. OK. I'm not sure why uh, why it might not be showing on your screen, but I believe everyone else can see it. Great. Uh, I'm just going to move so I can see what the next slide is. One minute. Sorry about these technical difficulties. There we have it. Okay. Um, so we will go into renewable energy support policies. This is just a breakdown of just the Canada, U.S., and Mexico, as you see, and uh, ranked according to regulatory policies, fiscal incentives, and public financing. I highlighted this just to show. Um, I think this table is an extremely useful one, and it links back to some of the 
REN21 outputs where they map this um, on a, a, you can go click on the country and see the details of all of these, including the regulation. And that's something we're also working on in the Green Energy Solution Center. So just, just a really um, useful piece of information. Next slide. The next slide you, you should see uh, is wind capacity and additions. Um, you can see the, the, um, the gigawatts there installed um, added in, in, in 2012 and the, and, and the total so, you know, wind, wind power capacity becoming a, 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 um, a, a big chip share of the overall uh, power sector growing very quickly and U.S. and Canada uh, playing their role there. Next slide. And this one we just put in as a Mexico, uh, comes from CFE in Mexico, um, capacity growth in wind, and you can see some non-linearities uh, starting to happen in uh, 2011, the, the lines really, the total lines going up uh, uh, exponentially, and we'll hope to see that uh, um, growth continue in the future. Next slide, please. Great, so the next um, few slides are drawn heavily from uh, one of the national labs here in the United States. I'm talking from the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, and these slides largely come from the Berkeley Lab, which is in California. Some of you, many of you may have heard of it. I, uh, this goes back to one of the original points I was making about the total capacity uh, addition. So renewables really becoming a very mainstream part of the energy mix. And what you see there on the right hand uh, access, right hand y axis is, is the capacity additions there um, for wind became about wind just wind became you know between forty and fifty percent of the total uh, and you can see um, how significant renewables were in comparison to uh, gas and coal in capacity additions in two thousand and twelve I, again I think that 's going to be one of the big stories we 'll we'll look back on on the GSR and the, these last years to show that uh, shift. Next slide, please. So we move a little bit, a, a few, a few uh, minutes in, in money and investment. Uh, this is taken directly from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, one of my favorite sources for this information. I'm sure most of yours. It's a fantastic uh, resource. This is something they, uh, a table that I believe they do in cooperation with UNEP, uh, and, and they work with many others in the international community. Um, but just showing the, the, the new investment in clean tech uh, in 2012, or clean energy, and the percentage change over the year before. Um, and you do see a significant investment in, say, the United States in 2012. They're showing $35 billion here, um, but a, a significant uh, decrease from the year before. Um, that, that, uh, that decrease is a, is a little bit more complex than just uh, less money being spent. The technologies are, are costing less. and, and there, there are a myriad of reasons why that um, goes down because overall investment or overall install capacity goes up. So don't look at that too um, deeply. Um, but just to give you a sense of the scale of who, who's doing what, what in that uh, in, in the money space, and then we'll hone in on some of the technologies uh, in the next couple of minutes. Next slide, please. So this again comes from our friends at the Berkeley Lab. They're doing tremendous work. I'll give a shout out to Ryan Weiser, who does much of this work uh, and has been producing fantastic work over the last, uh, well, long time. Um, this is an involved wind project cost, and and uh, and they look at all kinds of different individual projects. And of course, there's a wide range of installed project costs. That, 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 that's due to uh, technologies and, and uh, localities and regulation, and geography, et cetera. But um, you know, it looks like the, uh, the installed project costs coming down again from 2011 and 10, where, where it sort of peaked in the recent past um, to under this uh, $2,000 a kilowatt number. Um, just interesting to see the trends there and, 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 and the wide range of the project cost. It's not simple to give a single number, as you can see. Next slide, please. Great. Um, and this is from the United States, installed PV price in comparison uh, over uh, between different countries. Um, 
not comparing North American countries, but just looking at the U.S., uh, Australia, and Europe. And you can see the, 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 the installed price of TV just continuing to drop down, very, very low numbers, um, but uh, a high variability between countries from Germany, they're showing 2.6, up to Japan at 5.9. Um, uh, per watt. So the numbers vary tremendously, um, and that's a, a regulatory issue, a balance of system issue, et cetera. But, uh, but a, a great piece of work and interesting uh, for those of you interested in, 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 in the price per uh, watt. Next slide, please. So the next two slides, I just wanted to show you some work coming out of the National Renewable Energy Lab that has to do with the United States. Um, they are extremely deep dive scenarios. Um, several years to come up with these scenarios. And the idea was to look at can the transformation of the US electricity system handle very high penetration of renewable energy up to 90%. And the answer was that generation from technologies that are commercially available today in combination with a more flexible electricity system that includes market operation and system operation is adequate to supply 80% of electricity generation in 2050. So that was a, that was a pretty um, groundbreaking study and, a, and I think for this audience a very useful sentence uh, to look at that studies online and you can see the, the breakdown in, in that 80% in one scenario. There are, there are literally hundreds of scenarios in the work. Um, using uh, uh, NREL's REEDS model. Next slide, please. So this is the, uh, just looking at a, a several days during uh, annual peak coincident load and, and how the renewables combined with the uh, gas and, and, and coal and, and nuclear would, uh, would look like to fill the, the, the daily loads. Um, and, and so there was both a, a general expansion scenario, but also this kind of daily constraint to make sure that the, the findings were robust. Next slide, please. So I said I was going to talk about the elephant in the room. In North America, it's more than an elephant in the room. It's a, a significant part of the room, which you'll forgive my uh, butchering of that specific uh, cliche. Um, this is true across North America, not just in the United States or in Mexico and in, in deep offshore and in Canada and uh, heavy oil um, and in, in the United States in both uh, shale gas and type oil. Um, the two slides I show there are from the, the EIA, the, the Department of Energy, Energy Information Administration. Um, on, the, on the left side, the shale gas production uh, per day over time, you can see that is an uh, absolute the uh, exponential growth in that resource, and, and one that no one predicted uh, even a couple of years before it took off. Um, that's a significant part there that it was not predicted. And the side on the right shows um, the price predictions over many years from the EIA and the actual New York strip price. Um, again, uh, no one got it right. And so it, it, it makes for a difficult um, piece of information for energy policy planning. But the amount of the resource and the amounts that are being produced of this uh, unconventional oil and gas uh, in North America is of a scale that we have to find ways to, 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 to consider it explicitly within the renewable energy community. Next slide. Um, just a snapshot of, of how natural gas and coal are is just switching roles in the power sector. I don't want to go into that one too deeply just to say that there has been an enormous shift uh, in that. Next slide, please. And, and so what we did about all, or what we've looked at so far on some research on this is to say, you know, can, can we find synergies between natural gas and renewables? This is power generation. We have to look at how um, unconventional oil plays with renewables as well, but to start with, we looked at gas and renewables, and I think the important part of, of this conversation, and it's an ongoing one, is to make sure that we keep um, keep in mind that these two sectors can play uh, with some synergy, and there are going to be interactions whether we like it or not, so um, just something to highlight there. And uh, next slide just shows that I've finished my presentation. Again, it's been an absolute honor to speak on the GSR. I've been a, a, a big supporter of it, as I've said, for many years. I think it provides all of us with a really sound basis for 
uh, analysis and decision making. And uh, thank you to the Solution Center for uh, having me speak. And Morgan and Christine, I just want to thank both of you for the great presentation. Um, and again, remind the audience that if you wish to, you can submit questions to the panelists through the question pane in the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, and with that, I would like to uh, ask the first question that I received. Uh, and I believe this is directed more towards Christine. Uh, and that is, what is the total worldwide installed power capacity and energy generation? Are you on, Christine? I'm sorry, I have to unmute my phone, uh, my, my okay. husband, of course. Uh, yes, uh, the total renewable power capacity worldwide in 2012 exceeded 1,470 gigawatts. That is up about 8.5% uh, uh, from uh, 2011. So um, we see that effectively there is uh, quite some uh, significant uh, increase there. And as, um, as Morgan has uh, indicated, it is really um, uh, it is impressive to see that nowadays more than half or about half of all the new power plants that were added to the system are renewable based. I am just uh, in the process of um, checking, we also have a production figure um, of uh, what that means in terms of uh, terawatt hours. I don't have it uh, right here. I'm going to find it and then uh, we'll provide it uh, in, in writing uh, to, the, to the, the person who asked the question. I suggest. All right, thank you, Christine. Um, and the next question um, just mentions how it is inherently difficult to get accurate figures, especially from developing countries. And they were wondering, what is the approximate accuracy of the figures included in the REN21 report for installed capacity and energy generation? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Effectively, it is challenging to get data from uh, developing countries. Therefore, we do work with a, um, a whole network of uh, contributors. We have uh, about 500 contributors and reviewers for the job status report, plus another 200 contributors from uh, developing countries. Uh, that has uh, evolved significantly back in 2005 when the first job status report was produced by Eric Martino, um, that he was mainly uh, the lead author in, in um, portraying what's going on in the renewables market. Now there is a whole authoring team in place that relies on contribution from, from many people. Uh, I would say that the data figuring in the Global Sales Report is uh, about as good as it gets. Um, we see, however, uh, in the global discussion that there is still a lot of challenges uh, when it comes to, for example, biomass. And there are statistics which also heavily rely on the IEA. Uh, they, they still have some uh, deficiencies. That is absolutely clear. I mean, there is, for example, a situation in place that all bioenergy use outside OECD countries is considered as traditional biomass. So you see that the share uh, of uh, division between modern biomass and traditional biomass is uh, a bit arbitrary. There are many organizations, including ourselves, uh, ARENA, the World Bank, that are working on, on making the situation better. But uh, again, I think uh, it is uh, as, as close as, as it gets and as accurately as we can portray. Thank you, Christine. And the next question is also directed towards you. Um, so with respect to global renewable deployments, how impactful have feed-in tariffs been? Is wholesale distributed generation a majority? Uh, what, what we see right now is that um, the feed-in tariff policy is, uh, is responsible for the majority of uh, old wind and solar PV developments uh, all around the world. Uh, it is clearly uh, a policy instrument that um, 
that has generated, uh, that had a lot of success in many markets. However, I'm just coming back from South Africa. As I mentioned, uh, there the government has put in place, has decided uh, to do uh, tendering and has issued several bidding rounds. There the industry is uh, extremely satisfied with the process and uh, what we see uh, with uh, when talking to, to many uh, industry people and investors, we see the most important is um, not which uh, policy it is, but it is about the stability and the predictability of the policy framework. Um, we will need huge amounts of uh, additional investment in the sector if we were to reach uh, our, uh, our targets and our objectives. And I think it is very important uh, to bear that in mind that uh, what counts is uh, stability and, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, each country has, uh, has a preference uh, of uh, the instrument chosen with the fact that uh, renewable prices for equipment have come down significantly. As I mentioned, in many markets, uh, solar electricity is becoming now competitive with uh, retail uh, energy uh, prices. And so uh, also policies promoting net metering, for example, are showing a very, uh, a very good um, result and a very good impact. So uh, there is no uh, one solution fits all uh, approach, but uh, clearly uh, the need for um, whatever framework it is to be stable and to be predictable and not to be changed uh, retroactively, like we have seen in, in some parts uh, in Europe, which uh, effectively makes it very, very difficult for the industry to operate. All right, and thank you, Christine. Um, that is all the questions I've received from the audience. We did have one um, come in through email, uh, but unfortunately, we seem to have lost Morgan from the webinar. Uh, so I will email that question on to him. Uh, Sean, I'm, I'm, oh. I'm here if you want me to cover it. Sorry. Oh, OK, great. Yeah, I, did, I saw your name disappear, so I wasn't sure. Sorry about that. Um, so they were just hoping, Morgan, that you could elaborate on the financing mechanism, uh, particularly in the U.S. Yeah, um, I, I get that, that, that's a very broad question, and so it's probably best that we do answer that uh, via email. But uh, in the U.S., the, the one I referred to is the production tax credit that's been in place for quite a number of years. Um, the issue with it is that um, it requires uh, U.S. government or congressional um, approval, and so it, it often um, has deadlines for when things have to be built and has a somewhat uncertain future that, that tends to go up and down. And the GSR did a nice job of showing that when the PTC um, was gone, that the, the production numbers of the capacity additions in the following year tend to decline. And so you see a little bit of an up and down or a lot of up and down uh, with that specific mechanism. But of course, the wider financial support for renewables in the United States is, is rather large and complicated. And so we'd be happy to uh, get that information to you. There's some great work on the NREL website about things as, as, as wide as um, the investment tax credit and securitization and MLPs and REITs and all kinds of other instruments in the United States. Thanks, Sean. Definitely, and I will email that question along to you as well. Uh, we did have another question come in, and that is, are renewable growth rates getting us anywhere near climate change goals? Uh, well, I guess that's uh, uh, an interesting question, especially uh, and probably uh, motivated by the current uh, or the recent um, uh, published publication of the IPCC's uh, report. I mean, we see that uh, the world has passed uh, recently the 400 ppm uh, of atmospheric CO2. That is uh, potentially enough to trigger uh, a global warming of uh, 2 degrees Celsius. We see that with the current uh, IPCC uh, report uh, outlining, we are more on a track of uh, reaching a, an increase in uh, temperature uh, of uh, 4 4.8 uh, degrees. I think um, the, um, uh, that even underlines uh, the need to further accelerate the deployment of renewables. I think renewables alone will not be able to, um, to address the, the climate challenge. I think they have to be coupled 
with uh, very uh, stable and strong uh, measures on the demand side. So it's absolutely key to get uh, the uh, the demand side right, and uh, energy efficiency is, is absolutely needed. But clearly, I think um, there is a, a clear evidence of the need of decarbonizing uh, the energy sector, and their renewables will uh, definitely um, play an, uh, a leading role uh, and should play a leading role in the years and decades to come. All right, thank you, Christine. And the next question uh, is wondering if you can recommend an edu educational program for an attorney interested in developing project finance expertise. Uh, well, I think there are uh, a lot of um, um, capacity building programs now uh, existing uh, throughout the world. IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, has done, uh, set up a great platform which is called International uh, Renewable Energy Learning Platform, IRELP, uh, that you can access from the ARENA website. That gives an overview on, uh, on different uh, capacity building programs and different opportunities. And I'm sure uh, that there will also be something in the field of uh, renewable energy finance. Should the person not find anything there, then I would be happy to uh, provide bilaterally some, some ideas and some, uh, some suggestions. All right, and uh, just to clarify, uh, someone wanted to clarify on the point you made earlier about the total installed uh, worldwide power capacity. Uh, so mm -hmm. as, you, as you said, 1.5 terawatts of renewable power capacity is installed. What they were wondering is the total worldwide power installed capacity is that their, their knowledge is it's in the range of 15 terawatts and thus does that make the RE percentage about 10%? Are those the figures that uh, you've heard? Uh, no, uh, we have a, a, a right now uh, about, uh, so if, if I go back to the slide, we have at the moment uh, a situation where uh, about 26% uh, of to total uh, global power generation capacity is renewable space, and uh, where about um, 21% uh, percent of uh, electricity that is uh, consumed is coming from renewables. Yeah, so we will have to look into this again, but uh, actually the renewables uh, comprise 26% of uh, total global uh, power generation capacity. All right. Thank you for clarifying, Christine. Uh, and we do have a question uh, regarding Canada. Uh, they state that energy is largely an area of provincial jurisdiction, leading to widely varying enthusiasm for and approaches to renewable energy. What role do you see that the government, federal government, could play to overcome these varying levels of enthusiasm? Are there any parallels from elsewhere? I mean, I would say that one parallel I could see is effectively the European Union where um, we have uh, by now 28 uh, member states, so 28 individual countries that have all agreed to reaching an overall uh, target, a binding objective by 2020. And uh, this overall objective is then translated into very different objectives for the individual member states, uh, taking into account uh, financial capabilities, uh, potential, etc. So that could be a model, uh, and then effectively uh, we just see that in, in many parts of the world uh, provincial uh, governments and local governments are often more proactive than national ones uh, because they clearly they are often closer to the citizens, closer to voters, and, and they often have uh, even more drive than national governments, and it's probably also sometimes easier on that level to, uh, to, 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 to change things uh, than it is on the, on the federal level. So uh, there are examples and, uh, and, and there is definitely also on the regional level or on the provincial level the possibility to, to make getting things moving. All right, and the next question is uh, specific to wind energy. Uh, they note that uh, some countries, notably Australia and Canada, 
are starting to see more organized opposition to wind energy development, claiming health impacts, other, uh, other uh, impacts. Do you foresee this affecting growth forecasts for wind? And in addition, are there any lessons from other countries uh, that have not seen such pushback? Well, uh, I think it is important to notice that um, the uh, ownership structures of wind uh, development are very different from uh, one place to the other. And we have seen, especially in Europe, uh, in, we have seen that projects uh, involving citizens, involving uh, local municipalities, are often facing much lesser, much less resistance uh, from uh, opponents to wind uh, than uh, projects driven by utilities. I mean, I think it's very normal that people, uh, once people are involved in the projects and in the profits that are generated, they are much uh, less critical uh, about those. And I think also there is another trend which uh, makes me optimistic that uh, the development will continue with the fact that uh, we have seen some tremendous development in the field of offshore uh, lately and um, and of course, with uh, with offshore taking off, there the um, the the impact on, on on population is is much less given. And also in many other countries, there are uh, models showing how um, opposition can be overcome. But in general, I think uh, as with all renewables uh, programs involving citizens and uh, reaching out to communities, are the ones being uh, most successful and uh, are the ones uh, showing the way. All right, thank you, Christine. And that is all the questions uh, that I received from the audience. I will forward along through email um, those couple of questions we came across for further elaboration on them. Um, and now I'd just like the audience to uh, I'd ask them kindly to take a brief minute to answer a survey that we have. Uh, Heather, if you could display the first question, please. And that first question is, the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight. And next question, please, Heather. The webinar's presenters were effective. And the final question. The overall, the webinar met my expectations. And thank you to the audience for answering that survey. And on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd just like to extend a hearty thank you to each of our expert panelists, Christine and Morgan, and to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. It's had a great audience, and we very much appreciate your time. And I invite everyone to check the Solutions Center website over the next few weeks if you would like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentation, as well as previously held webinars. Additionally, you will find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. We also invite you to inform your colleagues and your network about Solution Center resources and services, including the no-cost policy support. I hope uh, everyone has a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solution Center events. And this concludes our webinar. <laughs>